welcome to our ongoing celebration of 20 continuous years of human presence on board the International Space Station. I'm NASA Public Affairs Specialist Brandy Dean. On November 2nd, 2000, the very first expedition crew arrived at the International Space Station, and since then there have been an unbroken string of 241 astronauts from 19 countries on board supporting science experiments, performing spacewalks, and teaching us how to live long term in space. But although the crew members in space might be the most visible piece of that puzzle, they are only a tiny percentage of the many, many people who have to work together to make sure missions are safe and successful. We're here today with some of the people that work on the ground and in particular through our flat operations directorate. And we have a few International Space Station program stowaways here with us as well. I'm going to let each of them introduce themselves and uh, tell a little bit about what they do. And then in honor of the anniversary we're celebrating, I'd love for each of you to also tell us where you were 20 years ago when Expedition, 20, when Expedition 1 was just beginning. And we are going to start first with Norm Knight. Well, let's see, Brandy. Uh, it's really an exciting day and uh, it's great to be on this panel. A uh, little bit of my background. Um, I've worked in, in flight ops for many years. I, uh, I'm currently the deputy director of flight operations. You know, thinking back 20 years ago, which uh, some days it seems like yesterday and some days it seems like a, a long, long time ago, uh, I had been uh, a group lead for one of the shuttle uh, groups that uh, that managed the main engines, solid rocket boosters and external tank and <clears throat> was recently selected as a flight director. So I was really transitioning from uh, shuttle to station. So exciting times, exciting memories and uh, look forward to to the rest of uh, the panel discussion today. Definitely. Thank you, Norm. Um, now we're going to go to Kenny Todd. Hey, good morning, Brandy, and uh, good morning to the rest of uh, my esteemed colleagues on the panel. It's good to see all of you. Um, I am I'm the uh, deputy program manager for the International Space Station. Um, have been for a, a number of years here, but uh, work very closely with uh, with the entire flight operations community and and have done so for 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 close to the last uh, 20 years now. Um, when I think back to where we were, uh, where I was 20 years ago, uh, obviously I wasn't in this position, but at the time my focus was over in avionics and software. And uh, one of the biggest challenges for a program such as this one, where you have hardware you know, literally being built all over the United States and, and in other parts of the world um, by, by different countries, uh, one of the challenges was trying to figure out how to integrate all that hardware and software. And there was a big, big effort in that that time frame uh, back uh, back ending the last century uh, when we were really uh, starting to to get this program off the ground and, and in orbit. And so at that time, uh, I, I had one camp uh, working working real time operations on the avionics and software side and um, uh, making sure everything was going OK on orbit as we as we started to bring up these different systems. And uh, at the same time, uh, I was off uh, trying to figure out the next flights in the queue and how to make sure that uh, that uh, that we were all going to be good to go and trying to find problems on the ground so we didn't have to find them and and give them to these uh, to these flight directors <laughs> later on uh, when they have to to deal with them. And again, good to see everybody. <laughs> I'm sure they appreciate that early work. Uh, <laughs> next up is Holly Ridings. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Holly Ridings. Uh, Today I am uh, the chief flight director uh, in the flight operations directorate, and it's it is pretty exciting uh, to sit here today, you know, after 20 years and and look back, you know, see some of the same faces on this panel, and and really have an opportunity to to celebrate everything that we've done. And and so today I'm the chief flight director, but if you go back 20 years, um, I was just starting out um, at at NASA as a flight controller just you know newly minted and was able to sit uh, sit console for uh, the very very beginning of space station and so for a while I, I would tell everyone I had the entire history of space station in my head and now it's gotten so complicated I don't think I can remember it all but uh, but for a while I could I could uh, go flight by flight by flight and, and uh, that was how I organized my whole life not birthdays not holidays space station uh, uh, flights were the milestones and and really still are actually uh, that's kind of how we mark time in our world so um, super exciting to be here and uh, hope you enjoy what we talk about today thank you next let's go to emily nelson good morning and hey to everybody 
So let's see, right now I'm the Deputy Chief Flight Director in the Flight Operations Directorate, and um, we're still also active flight directors. Um, 20 years ago, I was also starting out as a junior flight controller. Um, the Expedition One launch marked a transition where um, one role that we had early on was going to retire because the, the, the space station, which had actually been in orbit for a while, was going to have people on it. And so we were going to retire one position and move into a full team. So um, I was excited to be transitioning into additional uh, responsibility and, and getting maybe to become a little bit more senior as a flight controller someday. But I was a, a pretty baby flight controller back in, at that point in time. That's so cool. Um, how about we go to David Korth next? Hey, good morning. Uh, it's good to be back among friends. Uh, I hung up my flight director spurs several years ago. Um, so now I'm the uh, deputy manager of the ISS avionics software uh, division, what Kenny was doing 20 years ago. Um, 20 years ago, I was uh, sitting console in what we call the blue thicker, a uh, much smaller version of what's behind Emily right now. Uh, and I was the lead planner for Expedition One. And so, the, you know, I, I look back and I was reflecting uh, this last couple of days on what we've accomplished since then. And thinking, you know, how much preparation went into Expedition One, and as Emily mentioned, uh, the un uncrewed station that existed for a year and a half, two years before uh, the uh, Expedition One crew showed up, and how much work effort we all put into working with the Russians, trying to come up with what the plans were going to be, how we're going to integrate things together, and when we finally cut our first plan and uplinked, that's when it, you know, it hit us, uh, this is real, this is actually happening. Um, so, uh, and, and clearly a lot has transpired, uh, both with all of our partners and, uh, the vehicle itself and, and the evolution of operations. So I'm, I'm glad to be part of this group today. Must have been such an exciting time. Uh, finally, we're going to go to Pooja Jishrani. All right. Good morning, everyone. I'm happy to be here with all of you. Um, like Brandy mentioned, uh, my name is Pooja Jasrani and I am a flight director. Um, I was selected in 2018, so I'm one of the newer flight directors in our office. I was selected with five others, uh, making a class of six. And so I am the, you know, one of the baby flight directors, you would say, uh, but have had a lot of experience now at NASA. At, in 2011, sorry, I should say in 2000, I was um, in 11th grade. Um, I was in 11th grade and had a lot of space posters in my room and in you know, was very inspired by space and wanted to be um, where I am today. So um, very excited to be here. Thank you. This I saw a lot of head shaking with the 11th grade, but. <laughs> yes, this is already so much fun. Um, so now we're going to back up a little bit. Uh, although a lot of this group supports flight operations and mission control, that's not everything that flight operations does uh, if, by a long shot. So Norm, since you're the deputy director of flight uh, operations, why don't you give us an overview of what Flight Operations Directorate is. Okay, Brandy, in 11th grade, goodness, that, that's a shocker. Um, so Flight Operations, we live in a lot of acronyms, so you hear FOD, it's synonymous with Flight Operations, it's Flight Operations Directorate. And really what we are is a service organization uh, for all the major programs for uh, development and mission execution. And so what I'll talk a little bit about and give you an overview today is really for, for station, but uh, but it does support uh, all programs. And, you know, the program is our customer. We're an org of about 2,500 people, and we have three major functions within uh, flight ops. You could think of us as kind of like a tripod. Uh, one leg of that is our astronauts. We have about 47 active astronauts today. Uh, the other leg is uh, aircraft operations. We call it AOD. And we have about 60% of the aviation assets for the agency within flight ops. We have 19 T-38s that are used for uh, space flight readiness training. We have a cargo transport, the big guppy you've probably seen flying around. We have some high research um, uh, aircraft used for science and training. And then we have a Gulfstream 3 and a Gulfstream 5, which are used to, uh, to transport the crews home after landing and, uh, and get them back reunited with their family. And then we have the, uh, the plan, train, fly part of the organization, which is really the biggest part of, uh, of FOD, although it all works together. 
but really that plan train fly is what we do for the program we we really start planning and training each of these iss increments which are about six months long about a year and a half out and the teams very work very hard to take the program requirements uh, metabolize those into a plan a very detailed plan of how to how to accomplish this we train the astronauts we train the flight controllers uh, we integrate the teams and we get ready uh, to go in and, and execute that uh, in the real-time environment. And that plan really starts from when the astronauts leave their families to go to launch, uh, all through uh, all activities on orbit to the time that they uh, they come back to Earth and are reunited uh, again with their families. Where you see a lot of this uh, really culminate is in the Mission, Mission Control Center. Uh, many of you have probably seen Mission Control, whether you've seen it uh, in person or in photos. Uh, that's the command and control center for the International uh, Space Station. These teams um, work 24-7, 365 uh, days a year. Uh, the flight director is really the conductor in these uh, real-time teams managing uh, all the systems uh, on board. And, and the purpose of the teams in there is to manage the systems and also provide uh, crew safety uh, for this orbiting laboratory uh, in real time. The teams typically send about 30,000 remote control commands from the ground to the space station a month to manage this platform. So it's uh, it's very interactive, it's hands-on, it's tactile, and it's uh, and it's very uh, it's very rewarding. Um, you know, flight operations, we're very rich in tradition. Uh, we have our foundations of uh, what we call foundations of mission operations. They're leadership tenets, not unique to, to FOD, as we say, uh, but really for uh, for any uh, effort that requires leadership. It's discipline, confidence, competence, toughness, teamwork, vigilance, and responsibility. And it's these leadership attributes that define our culture. And this culture, in addition to the flight rules and procedures, is really what provides the framework for the critical decisions and the operations that uh, are ongoing as you see in real time uh, today. The teams are trained to expect the unexpected, uh, to improvise and overcome, and to work with a lot of other team members, both here at JSC and other centers, to always assure astronaut safety, vehicle safety, and achieving the mission objectives that are set forth uh, by the program. And FOD is a little bit unique in that as a support organization, we can knit this together across major programs with international partners, with uh, cargo vehicles, with crew vehicles, uh, and payloads, integrating them all together in both the development and real-time environment. Again, making it all work in support of our customer, the program. And I think that sets us up uh, now for maybe Kenny Todd to come and uh, tell us, I think it might be confusing to people that, that the people you see supporting flights, sitting in mission control, um, and uh, flying the space station don't actually work for the space station program. So maybe you can explain kind of that relationship between FOD and the space station program. Sure, uh, Brandy. Yeah, um, you know, the uh, the part that everybody sees um, on TV is is mostly astronauts and, and flight controllers and flight directors. I mean, that that is the face of human space flight. That, those are the people you see. And, uh, and quite frankly, those are the people that we, the program, um, have entrusted with this hundred billion dollar international asset, and so as Norm said, they uh, you know they they have the responsibility uh, given to them by the program to uh, to train train our astronauts, um, you know make sure that we have a flight control team that's certified and ready to go and and multiple levels deep in in failure response, um, and I think through the course of the history of of not just. Uh, this program, but all programs, you can see that the, the tenets that, that Norm laid out today have really been the foundation, which has been used in, in all human space flight programs and and, uh, and been executed very successfully. So anyway, yeah, uh, flight operations is is from a programmatic perspective. Um, there, there are so many different facets of the program. When you look at the engineering, the safety, um, you know, the people who manage our space suits, it's a, it's a huge program 
but somebody has to have that responsibility to operate the vehicle day in and day out. And we we uh, we look to the flight operations directorate uh, to do that. Keep uh, keep the crews trained, keep the vehicle safe, and and flying in a in a good way every every day. Now we have a control center over in Huntsville, Alabama, that their primary focus is going to be making sure that that uh, that while flight ops is taking care of the vehicle and keeping everything safe, that they're working with the principal investigators and and getting the science done on board station. So there's a nice nice sharing of, of, of roles there. But at the end of the day, we looked at the flight operations director to make sure that that, uh, that we take care of the vehicle, take care of our crews. And and uh, again, we, we complement that with a with a, a large workforce of folks that that make sure that we hold each other accountable from the standpoint of, of, of the technical requirements, our safety requirements, keeping our suits healthy. And so uh, anyway, that's kind of where where flight operations sits in our, our bigger overall program. Thanks. That was a really good explanation. Um, and I think uh, it brings up that, uh, you know, this space station isn't the first program that that um, FOD in some form has supported. We've been uh, you guys have been working with all the human space flight programs pretty much since the beginning. Uh, but I think probably the space stations uh, first that first expedition um, was was kind of a turning point for you guys, um, because among other things, it meant that Mission Control had to be open 24 seven. 365 days a year. Uh, I think Holly and David, you guys were were already um, flight controllers at that point. So maybe you remember a little bit about what that that uh, transition was like. Yeah, so maybe I'll go I'll go first and then I'll, I'll hand to David because I think our perspectives are maybe a, a little bit different, right? So I, I came in um, right when we were building up the, the team of folks, the flight control team that would work the space station. And so, you know, I, I, I didn't start on the shuttle side and then transition over like, uh, like Norm and, and Dave's got some experience as well. So to me, you know, the, the 24, 7, 365 is, is really the only world I've ever known. And, and we supported from the space station side, you know, round the clock. And then obviously when the shuttle came up and docked and we did joint missions together and really laying the foundation for so many ways that we partner with all of our international partners and then now our commercial partners as well. And so, you know, I, I was lucky enough to come and, and be some of the very first people to get certified on the, on the space station side and learned the ropes from that perspective. And, um, you know, expedition one, anytime you do anything for the first time, right. You know, there's always it's excitement, but also trepidation because you've spent so much time trying to anticipate and consider how it's all going to work together. And then you sort of go live and then you, you, you know, some of it works and some of it doesn't. And actually that's probably the best part of our job is getting to, to solve all of those problems, right? That's what all of us love to do um, after all of the hard work's been put in to, to prepare. So that's kind of my, you know, perspective on it. You're, you know, you're at the starting gate and, and you hit the go button in station you, you hit go and you never, you never stop. It just goes. And so again, you know, after 20 years, that's, that's the only world I've ever known, but I know that Dave and, and Norm had some more experience on the shuttle side before that than, than I did. So I'll hand to one of them. Yeah. Thanks, Holly. And, and I, uh, when I first got hired into NASA, uh, I came in as a, in the space station operations planning area, um, and we were always 52 months away from launching something. And so uh, our management said, hey, you know, it might be good for you guys to get some flight control experience if you're going to be part of the flight control team for space station early on. So I got uh, to spend four years doing shuttle flight control and flight planning. Um, and so for me, I got to see, you know, the heritage of NASA, at least when I was young, you know, maybe even as young as 11th grade back when I remember shuttle. And um the fact that you know I could make a flight plan, and if I wanted to change the flight plan, uh, I took out a pencil, I erased a couple of lines on a piece of paper, I drew some new lines, and then we faxed it up to the shuttle, and voila, there's the plan, and that was the change. And then all of a sudden, this new era of international cooperation and you know jointly agreed to um, operations and coordination, all these different words that were like you know. Certainly we coordinated and we, uh, we had international partners fly on shuttle. But now if I want to make a change to a plan, 
I had to go call the Russians. And then after, you know, years later, it was the Russians, the Japanese, the Europeans, the Canadians. We all had to agree on what the plan change was going to be. So cooperation and um, mutual agreement on how we're going to do things really became important. And so for me, that I saw that transition. And, and the other aspect, uh, and I know Norm's got some, he saw this same transition in, in mentality from the U.S. perspective of a lot of experience flying short duration missions, you know, and we were even uh, very proud of ourselves with our 16 day extended duration orbiter missions. And then we go talk to the Russians about this new space station project. And they like, you know, well, we've been flying Salyut, we've been flying Mir, we know long duration space flight. And so we have this ideological um, sort of conundrum where we both thought we were right. We both thought we had the right approach. And it, it was really sort of a meeting of the minds where we both had to come together and we brought in some new technology and some new approaches. They brought in years of experience dealing with long duration crews and how to operate something continuously. And so Expedition One was kind of the, uh, the culmination of all that discussion and, and began the adventure that we, we kept learning and things have changed quite a bit. And the relationships that we've got with the Russians uh, have changed and evolved quite a bit. And then we brought on all of our partners. So I, I, I saw that as, as kind of one of the main benefits to me of, of being part of the station is opening your mind to a different approach and how you can do things. And, you know, relying on your heritage and your experience, but using that to build something jointly together. Yeah, Brandy, I'll I'll add to that a little bit what uh, what Dave and, and Holly said. You know, the 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 fulcrum was really on the shuttle side initially, and so like Dave said, you know, our our big long duration missions were 16, 18 days max on the shuttle, and so we had shuttle teams off working shuttle. We had station teams working station, and it was a paradigm shift for a lot of the organization to go from, from these sprints on shuttle really to this marathon on station. And, and you could see over time it was, shuttle was, you know, king <laughs> per se, and that's the way things were done. But, but slowly and surely, uh, you, you know, evolution of human spaceflight was really transitioning to, to station and beyond. And, and so the shuttle, you could see starting to fade and even though it was bringing up the cargo, that mentality was, hey, this is the new way for the, the evolution of, of human spaceflight. And so that mentality of marathon is really, uh, it's, it's exactly what we're doing today. It's what we'll use today for, uh, for, for Lunar and Gateway and, and Mars. And it really, I think, has provided uh, a good proving ground for this. And we have changed significantly from from when we started station to now our whole flight control team model has changed because you know before if we took that shuttle model you have a lot of people on console and you're running those folks 24 7 it's not efficient you burn folks out and so really what you see today uh, in the station flight control room from a flight ops standpoint is is what you get it's a very small agile team uh, working uh, again to make sure that uh, the astronauts are safe and those mission objectives are are being met and we continue to evolve. So it's been it's been fun to watch. Well, the word marathon um, is a good one because uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about was Emily is I think the the record holder for most time spent in basically in that room in Mission Control. Uh, she has the I think the most shifts for a flight director. So I think we'd love to hear from her on kind of what uh, a regular day on on console is. Yeah, it's maybe a dubious honor. Uh, the flight director I took the honor from told me I shouldn't be too proud of having <laughs> so many shifts in this room. Um, so when I think of, you know, what a day in the life of Space Station is like, I think all the way back to my, when I first started working console for, for Space Station was actually 1999 as a shift duty officer about a year before the first crew showed up. And so back then, this was an uncrewed ship and you had fairly junior personnel, obviously, um, keeping an eye on it uh, uh, in the wee hours. And 
that was really just like I can remember back then the whole shift was really just about making sure that that, the, that we acquired com every rev and that the com was still working and that nothing looked funny. And then occasionally we'd end up getting a call from our trajectory officers warning us, hey, there's a piece of debris that might be heading towards the station. You should call everybody and get them working that. But, you know, super simple operations. And then over the years, you know, you get through the assembly phase. By the time um, Shep and company were on board, we, you know, that was just a little while before the lab showed up. So then we started doing research and we started really shifting through the years, you know, through assembly, where you're doing a lot of things for the first time, and anytime you do anything for the first time, you're going to learn maybe a lot. Um, and you're putting new systems on board, and you're learning about those systems, and you're you're building this space station one piece at a time every couple of months until you get to a point where you kind of call it assembly complete. At that point, now for many years, we've been using this amazing platform for for research. This is our orbiting research platform. And so a normal day today looks really different from a normal day on any one of those 21 years along the, the path. Um, we are supporting our crew members as they're executing a lot of, of research projects. Those research projects are different every month. We have a seemingly never ending stream of new research that's coming online and and getting to orbit and, and then coming back home and getting replaced by more. Um, occasionally, we'll have some systems that aren't behaving themselves, and so our teams will have to sort through those things. Um, occasionally, research doesn't go exactly as we planned, and so our team in Huntsville will have to work with the crew to sort out why it's not working the way it's supposed to and see what we can do that will still accomplish some science while working around whatever challenges we have. Occasionally, our international partner friends will have issues on their sides of the space station, and so we'll coordinate with them as they're working through the challenges to get their systems back online. Um, like last night, we had problems with a valve in one of our CO2 removal systems, so we had to work around that. We had our JAXA friends were operating their robotic arm on the outside of the space station to get ready for a satellite deploy tomorrow, and we were installing uh, some radishes in a plant habitat so that we can grow some radishes on board. I mean, it's a really diverse set of activities that are going on every single day, and um, it's, it's just different every day of the year for 21 years. I don't know how many jobs out there, when you show up for work, you just don't have any idea what it is. You know, it's gonna be totally different from the day before. And that's really what has just been so fun about getting to work on Space Station for all these years. I love that you haven't even left uh, to today yet. So <laughs> great background. I think yeah. Holly has something to add. Yeah, it was it was only color commentary, right? So, you know, we are all engineers and so we have this giant sheet of metrics, you know, spreadsheet of metrics and and so Emily watches the numbers go up and down and, you know, so last week she's like, "Hey, I need to work some console," you know, so when uh, when people uh, need help, she pitches in. So she's been actually on the night shift for the last couple of days and uh, she has to keep the very serious, very fancy trophy uh, for the more shifts on console which happens to be uh, one of those number one foam fingers like you get at a ballpark. So, you know, uh, we all have very serious jobs, but we also, you know, try not to take ourselves too, too seriously. You know, we, we live and work in mission control. All of us are there, you know, om almost every day, right? So when you see us do a panel like this, it's easy to hear the stories and think about 20 years, but, you know, we're, we're here because we love it and, and we still spend, you know, time in the building, on console, you know, Kenny, Kenny is, I think Kenny sleeps in his office and mission control sometimes. So, you know, anyway, I just, uh, just thought I would, uh, throw in a little bit of common color commentary. So that's it. That's perfect. I, I love that a foam finger for your trophy. Um, so for those who would aspire to such greatness, um, earlier this year, we had a call for applications for new flight directors. And I know based on the many emails that I got, there is a lot of curiosity about what it takes to be a flight director um, and then kind of how, how you learn once you get there. And since Pooja is the most recent addition uh, or, or one, of the, one of the most recent additions to that group, I thought maybe you could tell us a little bit about how that worked for you.
Sure, absolutely. So um, my story for becoming a flight director was that I actually interned at NASA uh, back in 2006, 2007, and then came back on full time in one of the flight control groups for the International Space Station. I worked in the ADCO group, which is in charge of the way the International Space Station basically flies around the Earth. Um, I was in that group for about 10 years uh, before I was selected to be a CAPCOM, which is a capsule communicator. Uh, a CAPCOM is, a person, is the person that talks to the astronauts on board the International Space Station. Um, I did that role uh, again then for a few years um, and then applied to be a flight director for the International Space Station. I was selected in 2018. Um, once I was selected, um, we went through about a year's worth of training uh, to get certified to sit on console. Uh, in that year's worth of training, we took a myriad of classes, basically all the classes that the astronauts actually take uh, before they fly on station, um, as well as we did a bunch of simulations. Um, and those simulations really tested the worst day ISS scenarios. Uh, and we really hope that those scenarios never happen in real time, uh, but those scenarios really prepare us for those days on consoles where things don't go as smoothly as planned. Um, so once we got to go through all the train classes as well as the simulation. Uh, we sat on console and did uh, real-time OJT to really learn the ropes of what happens um, every day on the International Space Station. And after that real-time OJT was complete, uh, we were signed off by our chief of the flight director office uh, to sit our first shift on console, uh, which was a really memorable day for me because I was able to invite uh, my family and friends um, to, to attend my first shift um, and sort of naming ceremony. Uh, so you you've got to tell us now, and I probably wish you go around the group. What what name did you give your your? Uh, I, I'm not sure even what you call the the, the noun our there. <laughs> yeah, sure, our team name. Um, so I my team name um, is Unity, and I am the 94th flight director um, in the flight director office. And so I'll let you go around the horn. Yeah, how about we'll go we'll go kind of in reverse order. Uh, David? Yeah, I'm I'm Odyssey Flight. And how did you pick that? Oh wow, you I've got to relive this this moment on console again. Um, for me, it seemed very appropriate because it, it kind of highlighted uh, the, the journey that I took that sort of went through a lot of uh, different turns, twists, uh, my own Scylla and Charybdis, so to speak, and uh, ended up, you know, where I, I wanted to be where I, when I started, when my boss asked me when I first got hired, what do you, where do you see yourself in 10 years? Uh, it was a little more than 10 years, but um, that's kind of, it kind of related to me and, and personified where I was, where I, how I got there. That's great. Emily? Yeah, I'm number 70 and my team name is Peridot. I had, let's see, there was one Christmas my mom had given me some Peridot earrings and I was not familiar with the stone. So I go look it up and come to find out it was a, uh, it's a gemstone that it, you have to have a, an iron rich environment to develop the gemstone and they're frequently found in meteorites. And so the image I had in my head was of somebody landing on some planet somewhere someday and turning over a rock and seeing a, a familiar stone, you know, a stone that we have at home and then they find it on on some planet far, far away. And so uh, I thought that would be a good kind of reaching forward name for my team. Yeah, that's a great story. Holly? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I'm realizing that, that we're going to leave Kenny out. So I'm sitting here trying to think of an honorary name in real time, but we may just have to take an action. <laughs> I'll just be, be Kenny. How about that? <laughs> You're just going to be Kenny. Awesome. Okay, so I uh, Viking Flight is my name. Uh, flight Director number 62. Um, there's been less than 100 uh, in the entire history of, of human space flight, less than 100 flight directors, which is why we all know our numbers uh, with this new class that that Brandy mentioned coming in uh, we might we might break 100 we'll see maybe not but uh, we are we are getting close uh, I'm so I'm number 62 Viking flight the reason I picked it is uh, before I came to the Johnson Space Center I actually worked at at Goddard Space Flight Center for uh, a little while and my mentor when I worked up there uh, was uh, a man named Gerald Soffin, and he was the project scientist for the Viking landers that landed on Mars. And so uh, as a tribute to him, uh, by the time I was selected as flight director, he was not alive anymore. 
Uh, also, as a tribute to uh, thinking ahead, going going to Mars, uh, which we all want to do someday, uh, headed to the moon with Artemis and then on to Mars. Uh, that's why I picked I picked Viking. Very cool. And Kenny, yes, sorry about that, but if you if you have a if have okay. if you have one that you want to throw out there now, we can take it. <laughs> no, I, I'm uh, I'm good. I, this uh, this is a special group of people, and uh, no, I uh, I don't want to tread on that tradition for sure. All right, and Norm. Well, let's see. I'm number fifty one, and my color is amethyst. And the reason I chose amethyst, no surprise with the color of the tie here, is. Uh, <laughs> I'm a traditionalist more, and uh, and so colors were were chosen as team names early on uh, with the you know first set of flight directors. And so, if you take the first three flight directors, you know, Chris Kraft, Gene Kranz, John Hodge, they were red, white, and blue accordingly. And I'm very patriotic, and so you mix red, white, and blue together, you get amethyst, and uh, and so that's how how it came about. So uh, there you go. That makes total sense. Well, so speaking of kind of the the origins of, of flight directors and, and going back a little bit in history, I think one of the things that uh, most people think of when they think of a flight director is that Houston, we've had a problem line and, and dealing with that the uh, uh, square peg in the round hole. Um, I I know that this is a job that can that can get your blood pressure going up. So I think you probably have some good stories. Uh, and maybe we can start with David because I know he has he has a, a pretty a pretty interesting one. Yeah, um, and I actually got to got to share it with Norm. So we we were uh, in the in the control room at the same time. Um, yeah, would one one of my interesting stories on a console was certainly the uh, US EVA twenty three back in July of twenty thirteen. Uh, it was a pair of EVAs that we were doing. Um, the uh, first of which was July 9th, so just seven days earlier, and we had. And, and we learned through this, uh, I, I, we don't have enough time to walk you through the whole uh, series of events that led up to it, but um, there were a couple of key things that, that I took away from the experience. Um, first and foremost is to uh, build on what Pooja just talked about. Uh, you know, when you get certified as a flight director, you go through rigorous training, uh, especially rigorous uh, simulations. And the, the intent of the simulations both for you as a flight director and as an upcoming front room controller is to, you know, quote, throw the kitchen sink at you, make you, give you the opportunity to experience those really awful days where a lot of things are going wrong, how you prioritize, how you make decisions, how you lead a team through, navigate through those problems to come out the other end uh, where everything's stable. You know, that's, that's at least the minimum goal. Everything's stable. Um, what I found, you know, you certainly aren't going to have the opportunity to simulate exactly what's going to happen. But what it does do is it prepares you mentally uh, to deal with things that are unknown because you fall back to your training. You say, hey, I've gone through all these things. You're thinking this stuff through your mind. Uh, I've gone through many scenarios where bad things happen and you, you can't just freeze up. You can't lock up. You got to keep thinking. And so falling back on the training that you know, Pooja had to go through to get certified and that when we go through for all these different dynamic events, whether it's EVAs, visiting vehicles, um, uh, any other kind of major event that we do on station, we try to simulate and spend time building team. So you understand how you and your team are going to react, um, building that kind of trust and building confidence, self-confidence in yourself that you can, you can get past a tough situation. Uh, the other piece of that is the reliance on team. It's not one person that's going to solve a problem. You have to rely on a team. Um, and to extend that, you know, this particular EVA, uh, we had two astronauts outside, Chris Cassidy, who just returned home from his second expedition, uh, and Luca Parmitano, an uh, ESA Italian astronaut, who also uh, came back from station for his second tour uh, not long ago. So kind of the end of the story is it all ended well because uh, they went back. But um, at the time, what what, uh, what we learned is that, you know, our international partners, we had an EVA with two people, one international, one U.S., and they they had absolute and implicit trust in the U.S. flight control team to lead an EVA and to resolve problems. 
And somebody asked me in the press conference shortly after the EVA, um, you know, did you, how was the communication with the ESA flight control team and were they concerned where, you know, what did they, they ask you and how did you communicate with them? And, and, you know, it made me think and, and, and realize that, you know, this partnership that we've created uh, is based on a lot of trust and mutual trust and that we didn't, you know, other than them following along and understanding that we, we were running this EVA and we had the best interest of all crew uh, the safety of everyone, regardless of what badge or flag they flew under, um, really hit home to me. Um, so the the event itself, uh, it took a you know we we terminate an EVA an hour and uh, just over an hour into an EVA with something that did not appear at first to life threatening, and after it was after we we declared termination that um, the event started to go downhill quickly, and and. You know, there, there was a little luck involved uh, that we terminated when we did and that the EVA itself was set up to where the astronauts were not as far away from the airlock as they could have been had this event occurred later in that same EVA where both going to different parts of the station and would have taken them longer to get back to the airlock. Um, it was certainly traumatic. And then certainly when we got back into the airlock and we got the helmet off uh, an hour and 41 minutes, PET or phased elapsed time, uh, you could see all the astronauts on the station, our Russian colleagues, everybody in the airlock doing what they could to help get that helmet off. The goal was get that helmet off as quickly as you can. A liter and a half of water and a helmet uh, when you're in space is, you know, putting your bowl, your head in a, a fish bowl. And so it was, it was great to see the international cooperation there at the very end. Um, I also had the pleasure of working uh, HTV3 with Holly, uh, that was the uh, Conatory 3 Japanese um, uh, cargo mission that ended up aborting when we uh, released it. It was one of those that we birthed, we brought it in and birthed it to uh, the No 2 Nader, and then we released it with the robotic arm. And a, a number of different events transpired such that it went forward instead of down. And then that sort of caught our attention there in real time. Uh, but that was working with the Japanese control team and a lot of communication back and forth. And again, it fell back to the mutual training that we did with our Japanese colleagues um, to build trust, uh, the cooperation, the understanding of how each of us was react in tough situations so that when something unforeseen happened, uh, there wasn't, you know, uh, multinational panic. It was, it was, Hey, we can, we can deal with this. And, uh, and get through this together. I think I'll stop blabbering on it at this point. Yeah, I would imagine uh, there might be some other good stories out there. Anybody want to share kind of the the most heart stopping time on on console that they've had? Yeah, I, I, I'll do a quick one. Right, so. Um, was on console early on as a flight director, um, and we were bringing a, a progress vehicle into the space station. Um, and so, typically, that's an uncrewed, uh, you know, cargo vehicle. The Russians build br comes up to flies up to the space station automatically. Uh, normally, what happens is it uh, has an antenna that moves out of the way when it gets close, such that then makes room for uh, the the docking mechanism to to mate with the space station without any interference and unbeknownst to uh, us on the ground that had not happened correctly. It had not retracted properly. And so the progress is, is coming on in. And, and of course that antenna created some structural interference. And so when it tries to dock with the space station, it didn't, it didn't work correctly. Um, when you have two vehicles in space and you try to put them together, you do what's called free drift, right? You don't want firing, Jets are moving around on either one of them. They don't go together nice and nice and neat. So uh, we're in a position where the progress is coming in and the space station is is drift. We're trying to put them together. And of course, it doesn't work quite right. So um, then we had to figure out what to do. And this of course, is our, our Russian colleagues um, trying to figure out how to go ahead and get what we call you know structural structural mate such that now we can start firing the thrusters again, you know, have attitude control of the of the space station. And so you know, that story may not sound, uh, you know, sort of 
yeah, sort of adrenaline pumping, maybe when I when I tell it very technically like that. But um, this is not something that that happens. Uh, typically, we rendezvous lots of vehicles to the space station. Um, it usually goes really well. And so having one where you're unable to uh, finish completing the docking, but also not be able to get off the space station because you've kind of got this this incomplete mating. Now you've got your space station in in drift. Uh, if you stay that way too long, um, you're not pointed in the right direction. You don't have power. Um, you don't have communication, and so that situation can start to uh, start to go badly fairly quickly. And so you know, as Dave was pointing out, it's a it's a team thing. And in this particular case, you know, our our Russian colleagues worked closely with us to figure out to figure out what to do. Um, You've got the safety of the crew on board. That's the most important thing you're thinking of in that situation and wanting to get the space station, you know, back to a, a place that's that's safe for them in, in terms of power and consumables and 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 obviously this this structural mating that's going on. So sometimes things go go wrong and you have to figure out what to do. In that particular case, we got uh, we got enough structural uh mating that we were able to do the there's hooks clamps that kind of pull the two uh two vehicles together and get back into a, a safe state um, but it was very uh sort of adrenaline adrenaline inducing for a period of time while we figured out what to do and you know brandy always asks these questions and we're all trained to tell them in these like super dry boring voices you know because that's what we do on console when things go wrong and i'm not sure it quite it quite conveys uh you know, the, the situation to, to folks out there. Uh, but, you know, I decided I'd try a little bit. So hopefully people understand that, uh, you know, that's our equivalent of heart pounding where we have these very calm faces and sort of monotone because <laughs> that's, that's what we're trained to do. Yeah, and just to add some color commentary to that one, um, I remember that day because I was with a team that was doing a training run upstairs and word spread that, because it's, it was pretty unusual for a progress to not dock totally normally. And so word had spread upstairs and this, and we pretty much just like everybody took a pause and we moved our data from our simulation training data to the real time data to just kind of follow along, you know, with bated breath from upstairs to see what, what are they going to do? How are they going to solve the problem? You know, we had a whole team that was following along that really it was it. Yes. When you describe it technically and in the moment, you can't get all you know, we don't make it a big exciting event, but I will tell you that from another room in the building having nothing whatsoever to do with the op, we were all watching because it was a, a kind of a really scary event. And I'll, uh, let's see, Brandy, I'll, I'll jump in kind of from a, a program perspective. I don't, I don't sit and do the, do the actual console work, but, um, you know, I, I look at from a programmatic perspective, we've asked the flight ops team, uh, you know, take care of the crew, take care of the ISS. Um, and if something goes wrong, you know, my perspective is get us through the shift, get us stable, and then we'll step back as an integrated group and take a look and see what our options are, try to figure out how to go, how to go forward. And um, at least one of the examples that I can think of, and maybe, maybe one of y'all can help me remember, for some reason it was, I think it was 12A or 13A, we had a shuttle, shuttle dock to station. And um, uh, for whatever reason, the Russians had a computer failure and uh, we thought oh no big deal and then they had another computer failure and you're like well that's uh, you know unfortunate for those guys and then you realize well that's really unfortunate for all of us because uh, because we need them in order to be able to um, stabilize the station so the shuttle can leave and we had absolutely no clue as to what happened with the russian computers the russians didn't really have a good understanding uh, there was um um, there was a lot of uh, concern, I'll put it that way, because we were really in a situation where we couldn't keep shuttle forever trying to figure out what to do. Um, we were uh, concerned about overall maintaining attitude control. Um, should we try to undock and not have these computers that could control the propulsive systems? Pooja, you probably remember this. But anyway, um, so uh, anyway, I just remember that was a, a uh, very concerning time for us at the program level because we were still building station you know we were still quite a ways from being done and uh, to have a problem like this where you're really looking at each other going how are we going to get out of this i mean this this could 
uh, you know, be a, a step in a very bad direction if uh, if we try to let a shuttle go and not have a, a good way of ensuring that we can clear it from the station without any kind of a, a contact. So it was um, at least um, uh, over a period of days, it was it was something I think a lot of us lost sleep over uh, working with the entire team, engineering, uh, our operations team, our safety communities, um, our partners, our Russian partners trying to figure out because it wasn't just as simple as rebooting uh, that computer and bringing it back up, the, that it was a, a much more involved technical issue that uh, uh, again, uh, kind of felt like it brought us to our knees there for a period of days, and I assume some of you might might have remembered that one. Yeah, so I'll, I'll pick up for just a few minutes because I was actually on console. I worked that I worked that mission from the flight director console. It was actually my very first joint you know joint mission. So I'd been certified before that and had worked space station ships, but that was my first first joint mission on the on the ISS flight director team. So I came in, I was the the crew overnight shift. We put the crew to bed and I came in and and the lead of of uh, of our team said, "Well, we're in free drift and we can't figure out how to get out of it. Um we needed the the computers on the space station to work and then be able to hand back and forth in terms of the shuttle taking overall control of the of the combined space station shuttle." Um, but we were trying to get back to where the space station, you know, took took control of that. Like Kenny said, we couldn't couldn't have the shuttle do that forever. Um, and so I came in, and we're free drift, and and we don't know how to get out of it. But here's here's the lesson I learned, right? So one of the more senior uh, flight directors was the lead, and she looked at me and said, "Okay, so while we're figuring out how to get out of free drift, you know, what what else can you do? We actually needed to move the mobile transporter, which is." Um, a piece of equipment where the robotic arm can ride up and down the length of the space station to set up for an operation the next day. So, you know, as a new flight director, you're just, you're kind of like, okay, here's our problem. You know, she was looking up and out like, hey, let's keep moving forward safely while we're still solving this really bad problem over here. You know, and it was in my early flight director career, one of the the most important lessons that I've learned. What can you do to move forward, even when faced with a problem that right now you don't know how to solve? How do you move forward, you know, safely, of course. And so we moved the mobile transporter because we had to be free drift to do that anyway. We happen to already be free drift while we're over here trying to figure out how to solve the problem. The other piece of that is when you have a problem that big, everyone just shows up. Like, it's amazing. You don't have to make phone calls. People just know. Like Emily was saying earlier, the team in the other room is looking at the data. Everybody's at home watching NASA TV. You know, people are getting things on their phones now more than they used to because phones are a little more more uh, uh, prevalent now. But but the data just gets out. And people just show up. What can I do to help? And, and we formulate what's called a Team 4 where you have a another set of folks go really, really focus on that problem, leaving us in the control room again, to continue flying the mission as much progress as we can make safely. So, you know, those are like two of my biggest flight director lessons that, that I carry with me from, from that specific uh, incident that, uh, that Kenny brought up. Now I'll, just add one, I'll just add one quick thing. So I actually started at NASA about two weeks after that shuttle flight. And it was the biggest buzz in town. I mean, the amount of conversations that happened after that shuttle flight and all the things that the team had done to recover. I mean, that was sort of my getting my feet wet uh, and really learning all about what FOD does. It, it was a great experience to start um, learning from. Yeah, that, that that's so that's so cool. I feel like we could listen to your battle stories for a long time, but. Um, I know you've got uh, other things to get to today, but I did want to wrap up a little bit by talking kind of um, about how flight uh, flight director uh, flight operations directorate is is still evolving as we have new programs coming online. I know um, Holly, you supported the the first uh, SpaceX cargo mission, and Pooja, I think, is getting ready to support the first Boeing commercial crew mission as well. So um, maybe you guys could talk a little bit about um, about how things are, how we're adapting to those those new demands. Yeah, so you could probably do an entire panel on just that topic, right? Um, Kenny, Kenny was there as well. Norm was sitting behind me. So I was the uh, the flight director, the NASA flight director, sitting in the ISS 
you know, flight control room responsible for the very first Dragon that came to the space station. So this is 2012. Um, to put that in perspective, we've now done over 20 of those, if you count uh, that demonstration, headed into uh, the 21st under under the, the space station cargo contract. So, I mean, two-ish a year for the last, you know, almost, almost 10 years now. So, um, amazing to see how far we've come. You know, when you sit there the first time, we talked about this when we talked about Expedition 1, right? You've put all this blood, sweat, and tears, planning, trying to figure out how to do this. Again, Kenny remembers all of this, and then and then you go live, and it doesn't it doesn't work exactly uh, like you'd planned. And that's where we really get to do our jobs. That's where that's what they pay us for, right? Is to figure those things out. And so um, we got about you know 120 meters from the space station, and our, our navigation sensors that communicated with the SpaceX Dragon. Um, didn't didn't look quite right, so we got to sit there for a little while and and figure out how we were gonna gonna manage that in order to get uh, the the two vehicles to communicate and navigate in uh, navigate in safely. Um, and ultimately, we did figure it out. It's another one of those stories where like literally heart pounding, but you know when you tell it afterwards, it's like okay, well we sat there and calmly worked through it. You know we had our engineering support, we had the program folks. You know Kenny was in the other room, Norm sitting behind me. And, and we figured out what to do and, and do it safely and were able to bring the vehicle in. We did have to sit, you know, 120 meters from the space station for for a while, um, making sure our navigation sensors were working correctly between the two vehicles. And so, you know, from my standpoint, you look back and now where we are with commercial um, is really amazing. So you, you know, a tipping point in, in human spaceflight for us to be able to incorporate a commercial partner and and bring them safely into the space station, um, but to us, right? Who started, you know, at the beginning of the space station, it it was just another opportunity, right? We we had uh, done Expedition One, we had figured out how to incorporate, you know, over time all of our international partners add their modules and their vehicles to the space station, and this was just one more in a in a continuum, and and so we look forward now with all of the the pieces that we continue to do on space station and you know on into artemis and and for us that's you know con continuing to build on the skills and the, and the culture you know at the end of the day it's about relationships and teamwork and trust and and you go and you figure out that that combination with with every partner with every provider with every team that, that we interact with and you know that's really the amazing thing to me about the international space station one of the most amazing things and so again i could talk forever but you know kenny and norm were there as well so i'll i'll hand to them well i'll provide just one aspect of it that that holly hit on and it's the teamwork and its relationships and and you know it was a fantastic day to get dragon birth but if you look at the journey to get there um that that was really what made it special because you know the the commercial cargo came on the heels of the constellation program being canceled nasa deferring funds from um government type work into to more of the private and commercial industries to where nasa buys a service instead of actually building a vehicle so that was the forefront of that and i'll tell you that the, the the dynamics between <laughs> commercial and, and NASA and government at that point was pretty toxic. It was, you know, NASA funding has gone down. It was given to commercial. It was just, it, the timing was bad and the environment was, was not great. And it really took, you know, Holly and her team and Kenny and the programs to, to really start helping um, build trust, as Holly said, because we were doing a lot of finger pointing back and forth. And it was getting us nowhere. Uh, and until you know those relationships started to be built, the trust started to be uh, instilled in that you need us. And NASA recognizes that we needed them as well. We're not the enemy. We're the solution. So are they. And we have to work together. So we started focusing. Instead of pointing at each other, we're pointing now at a common goal, that common goal of successful commercial cargo. And that is the foundation, and the success of that is the foundation we're resting on today with commercial crew. It's what we're going into with the uh, gateway and human landing system, and and it all goes back to that. So leadership matters, relationships matter, and people and trust matter. So uh, just a great success story. I see, and and Norm, absolutely, I agree with with you and Holly both. I mean, um, if we look back at when station started. Did we know that we were going to end up in this model 
uh, not not necessarily. I mean, we've sort of had to adapt the mission along the way uh, based on on the guidance and direction that we've been given. And um, and the, again, that brought some new people into our, our our circle that we didn't didn't know about when we started this. But but um, uh, one thing I talk to people about um, up and out a lot is is the fact that that we have a space station culture. Uh, there's not, you know, every partner, every whether it's commercial or whether it's international, everybody brings their aspect of how to do things and how to look at problems and how to look at challenges and and how to accomplish things in their own way. But at the end of the day, you have to figure out how to to make that work with everybody else. And and what ultimately comes out of that mixer mixer, if you will, is a is a space station culture. And and we understand each other. Um, I, I like to tell people, you know, the technical problems don't really know international boundaries. They don't know contractual boundaries. They are problems. Uh, you know, you solve them the same way. The physics doesn't change just because you, you talk a different language. And so uh, you have to get together. You have to figure out how to work together to do that. And and I and we did it early on with the partners, um, our international partners. And I think with our commercial friends, we're starting to see that same thing as, as both Holly and Norm talked about. Uh, you know, the, the early part that storming, forming, norming thing that there was a little bit of storming early on and, and it took us a little bit. But uh, I think uh, in the end, you know, we had arrived at, a, at kind of a, a, a cultural understanding of how to get things done. And it's been extremely successful. And and, um, uh, you know, I think it's going to carry us forward, as Norm said, as we as we start to not just work with international partners, but also commercial partners and and trying to uh, to go live around the moon and, and, and go do some work on the moon. Yeah, and Brandy, uh, yeah, I was just I was just going to mention that I think this is also just a very exciting time for younger generations. You know, the last time we flew off of U.S. soil was in 2011 for our last shuttle flight. And so to get to see uh, DM2 this summer fly, I mean, it was the buzz around town. It was the buzz around the world, you know, to get to see these astronauts go to the International Space Station and fly off of U.S. soil. And I think the SpaceX team is doing an outstanding job. And we have, a you know, a flight coming up in the next few weeks, as well as Boeing working really hard um, to do the same thing. So I think, you know, the next few years are going to be super exciting. Definitely. A lot of excitement these past 20 years and a lot more excitement to come. I think we are just about pretty pretty much out of time, so, but I did want to give um, Norm a chance to just kind of wrap up for us a little bit what we've talked about today. Well, Randy, great discussion, great panel, and, you know, I don't know how many folks have had the opportunity to uh, go out and see an ISS viewing where you go out and look in the night sky, early morning sky, and see a uh, station flyover. But if, if you've not had that opportunity, go do so because, you know, station didn't happen on its own. Uh, it was, you know, one vote in Congress. It took a lot of uh, teams to put this orbiting uh, outpost in orbit. <clears throat> and so when you look up at this, um, this magnificent laboratory that's the size of a football field. It's nearly a million pounds of mass uh, in orbit, uh, orbiting the Earth about every 90 minutes. You realize it's real. There's human presence on board. There's been human presence for the last 20 years. And, you know, <clears throat> it really is an engineering marvel. And, and to me, miracles, uh, you know, miracles do happen when you have a vision uh, you provide the leadership, the perseverance, the political support, and and teams that manage this thing day in and day out, and have been doing that for the past 20 years. It's it's incredible, and you know it's a great orbiting uh, laboratory for science and research, and it's also being used as a great um, uh, platform for developing hardware that's going to evolve us to the moon and Mars and beyond. So this is amazing 20 years has gone by in a blink of an eye uh, but the relationships and the teams that have made this all happen are what's uh, going to evolve us uh, to getting on the moon by 2024 and making that a reality as well so i think i can speak for all of us that you know being part of this is just really special and uh, <clears throat> just really glad to be here today with our friends and see uh, just what this has become and how it's evolving even into the future. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you so much, Norm. That's a great idea. Definitely go out and wave at Kate, Sergey, and Sergey as they are flying over. And then uh, later this month, you'll get a chance to cheer on the Crew-1 crew as they launch to the space station on our SpaceX Dragon as well. 
Um, this is just the second in a series of six panels. So you're going to want to watch out for the rest of this series. Um, coming up is going to be all about science. That's the next one that we'll be holding. So you can watch out for that. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, here's to 20 more years. <laughs>